ovarian physiology. I really want you to understand ovarian physiology by just thinking about different concepts and what cells you are going to hit. This two cell theory of the ovary is really important. So let's take it step by step. So step number one is you get pulsatile GnRH secretion. That is then going to trigger LH and FSH to be secreted from the anterior pituitary. That LH and FSH from the anterior pituitary, an embryological tie-in for anterior pituitary, is that it's derived from ectoderm and Ratsky's pouch. What's a tumor of Ratsky's pouch known as? Craniopharyngioma. So you need to know these kind of things are just like boom, 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 firing in my mind as I talk to you because they're so high yield for you to integrate. All right? So LH and FSH are going to be released via the anterior pituitary. And what the LH does, LH is going to stimulate the theca interna cells. LH is going to stimulate the theca interna cells. And when it stimulates the theca interna cells, it makes testosterone. LT, okay, I think of the football player, Ladanian Tomlinson, LT, and then T, theca interna cells, you're going to make testosterone. That testosterone then goes to the granulosa cell. That testosterone goes to the granuloma, granulosa cell, and that granulosa cell makes the grand hormone of the female. What is the grand hormone of the female? That's going to be estrogen. Granulosa cell has aromatase, and the testosterone gets converted to estradiol via aromatase. Guess what? Pharmacological tie-in here. What is going to be an aromatase inhibitor? Anastrozole. Anastrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. I mean, this is, this is the level that you will get to, I promise, before your exam. Okay? Stay focused. Stay inspired. Okay? All of this energy and all of this focus right now is so, so worth it. I promise you. Okay? And it's important for you to know that the granulosa cell is going to secrete inhibin, and this inhibin is going to feed back to FSH. So, when we talk about the clinical correlations, let's talk about placental aromatase deficiency. Placental aromatase deficiency is going to present as a 38-week uh, pregnant mother who presents with increased hair growth, especially tracking up her abdomen. Her levels are going to be elevated. Okay, So now this pregnant girl has a lot of hair. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is that you need to realize that when mom is pregnant, how does mom make that estrogen? Mom makes the estrogen by taking baby's fetal androgens, baby's adrenal gland androgens, those adrenal androgens from baby, they cross over. How beautiful is this? Placenta is such a great organ. That fetal androgens, they go and they go to the placenta where those androgens are going to be uh, converted to what? Estratriol, estriol via placental aromatase. And so in placental aromatase deficiency, what happens is, is that those fetal androgens, they don't get converted into estriol. What do they do? They just cause hirsutism in the pregnant mom. Get it? All right. Beautiful. So I think that it's important for us to talk about in reproductive, the menstrual cycle. Okay. The menstrual cycle People get confused as to what's the difference between follicular, secretory, proliferative. People get so confused about this. So can I just simplify it for you? The way I'm going to simplify it for you is I want you to realize that the menstrual cycle can be defined via organs. And the two organs you define the menstrual cycle by are the ovary and the uterus. If you define the first phase of the menstrual cycle by the ovary, that is going to be called the follicular phase. And the follicular phase, or the first phase of the menstru uh, menstrual cycle, is estrogen predominant. The same parallel phase that is going on in the uterus is going to be proliferative. That's the first phase. So when somebody comes up to you in the grocery store and is like, yo, man, what about the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle? You're like, wait, wait, wait. That's the first phase of the menstrual cycle that's defined by the uterus. Thank you so much. The second phase of the menstrual cycle, as defined by the ovary, is called the luteal phase because it's corpus luteum. What does corpus luteum secrete? Progesterone. And the second phase of the menstrual cycle, as defined by the uterus, is going to be secretory. Think about it anatomically. You won't get confused. 
The key thing that they, uh, USMLE wants you to know, we talk a lot about negative feedback, but what's an example in our body of positive feedback? And that's the L8 surge around day 14. That's an example in our body of positive feedback. Remember that menses occurs because you are going to withdraw progesterone. Clinically, we use a progesterone withdrawal test to stimulate menses. What is going to be the histological layer of the endometrium that you're going to shed? It's the functionalis layer. And remember, what is going to regenerate the endometrium? That's the basalis layer. And so you know what the USMLE question is here? There's going to be a patient who comes in with recurrent, what is DNCs? Dilatations and curatage. The girl just wants abortions after abortions and the uh, OBGYN, scrape, 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 scrape. And now they present for infertility evaluation. What the hell is going on? USMLA step one question is that you scrape, scrape, scrape so much with those recurrent DNCs that you scraped off the basalis layer of the uterus. And thus, now you don't have a stem cell layer. Well, you just have a fibrosis layer. Let's talk about pregnancy. So when you have the menstrual cycle and you get lucky and you are going to have a baby, remember the egg and sperm are going to meet, what is going to save the corpus luteum from involuting? That's going to be beta HCG. So cool that the corpus luteum maintains the pregnancy for the first trimester. So what produces progesterone during the second and third trimester? During the second and third trimester, it is going to be the placenta that is going to make the progesterone to become progestation. How is estradiol going to be produced? Uh, how is estrogen going to be produced? I'm sorry. Estrogen is going to be produced because the baby is going to make its fetal androgens. That, those fetal androgens are going to be hydroxylated in the fetal liver and then travel to the placenta where they are going to get aromatized and become estriol. Remember, estradiol, that's in all of you girls right now. That's going to be the um, uh, pr predominant estrogen. Estriol is the predominant estrogen when we're talking about pregnancy. So the reaction here is aromatase. What does this human placental lactogen do? Human placental lactogen, this is going to be diabetogenic. It's a hormone released in pregnancy that is going to um, be a, uh, a cause. Clinically, how, how we think of it is that it's diabetogenic. So human placental lactogen may have a role in gestational diabetes mellitus. So a mother has an abnormal tri-screen in the first trimester of pregnancy. It is noted that the beta-HCG and inhibin are going to be elevated. Beta-HCG and inhibin are elevated, and you have low AFP. This all suspects Down syndrome. That's a good learning point, is that on the tri-screen, elevated beta-HCG and elevated uh, inhibin A are characteristic of Down syndrome. An ultrasound confirms 11-week pregnancy. What is the best way to confirm a genetic diagnosis. The best way during this time to, to, uh, to confirm a genetic di diagnosis is chorionic villus sampling. So chorionic villus sampling is sampling of the placental villi as a means of prenatal genetic testing, and that can be done anywhere between week 10 to week 12. Now, what is the difference between chorionic vi uh, uh, villus sampling, CVS, not Walgreens, CVS, and amniocentesis, sampling, uh, come on, come on guys, really, really? <laughs> You're like, come on, play in two speed, let's do this. All right, so amniocentesis is going to be different than uh, CVS because amniocentesis has sampling of the amniotic fluid as a mean of pre, uh, prenatal genetic testing. However, it is going to be a little bit later and that is going to be during 14 to 18 weeks of gestation. So a good microbiological tie-in for you guys is knowing the torch infections and how they uh, affect pregnancy. So when we talk about blueberry muffin rash, what is the diagnosis here? Rubella or CMV. And the mechanism behind a blueberry muffin rash is extramedullary hematopoiesis. Deafness, cataracts, and PDA. Deafness, cataracts, and PDA. We are thinking of congenital rubella. Thrush, generalized lymphadenopathy with hepatomegaly. What do we think of here? We are thinking of HIV, nonspecific symptoms. Intracranial versus periventricular calcifications. This is a really high yield distinction for you to know. Intracranial calcifications are related to toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis, intracranial calcifications, hydrocephalus, and chorea retinitis, that is going to be the triad of toxoplasma. Related to CMV. 
and CMV is related to periventricular. So I think of CMV as the calcifications being peri-C or around the C, periventricular. And that is also related to sensorineural hearing loss. The treatment of CMV, gancyclovir, whereas toxoplasmosis, sulfadiazine, pyrimethamine. Remember that gancyclovir is going to be activated by a CMV viral kinase, and that gancyclovir now activated by the kinase is going to preferentially inhibit viral DNA polymerase.